The journey of OTF is the journey of all the teachers and teacher federations, I think, across Canada, as we've begun to grow in our understanding of our Indigenous brothers and sisters, our neighbours and our friends. So if I go back into kind of the beginnings of it, I would say in, in 19, somewhere around 1998, the president of Ontario Teachers Federation, Liz Barkley, was inspired through her uh, interactions with community and with education to join with um, uh, Indigenous leaders to work on what was then the Canadian Aboriginal Festival. And so we partnered with uh, Indigenous organizations to make sure that we had a wonderful festival that for many years took place here in Toronto and then later moved to the Cop Stadium in, in Hamilton. And as part of that, we made sure that there were teaching resources available, that there were all kinds of, of books and ideas, and, and our wonderful, wonderful partners made sure that there were many other things that you could do in terms of entertainment or shopping or exposure to, to cultural and sacred items and to the stories. People from all over Ontario brought their classrooms down for the Aboriginal Festival, which was held on the solstice. And it was, I think, a real turning point on who we are and where we came from. So, you know, I gathered some materials because this is part of our history and it's part of our growth. This is one of the handouts that we gave in, in 2008, which teachers would pick up. Um, so we have, we have some lesson plans and some ideas from grade three up to grade eight with links to heritage and citizenship, to history, um, and to Canada and world connections in terms of looking at um, our Indigenous neighbours and realising that, that we are all part of the same community. That was part of the journey, but it began to grow. It took a long time to grow in Canada, but, but it did grow. And so somewhere around 2003, shortly after the election of, of the Liberal government, the government determined that there was a hole in the education system, that we weren't addressing the needs in Ontario of being able to teach a real history of Indigenous people and do it with respect. And so they created at that time the Aboriginal Education Office. And OTF was the voice of teachers there, and we worked with elders and representatives of, of different communities, many of them chiefs, and we tried to decide among ourselves what a realistic and respectful education would look like and sound like. At one point in the journey, this, this particular office said, OTF, you understand how to teach. Could you go and create a resource that we could give to every teacher in Ontario, we can give to every school, that gives them the definitive how to teach for, for, um, for FNMI education, although we didn't call it FNMI education then. Remember, we were still using Aboriginal at the time, and then over time, um, that office at changed to be the Indigenous Education Office and then was became um, FNMI. So we were part very early in and we were given that task and talking to people here at OTF, they were excited but they're teachers and one of the first things you, you understand as a teacher is don't get ahead of your students or they'll never catch up. And we felt that, that our classrooms and our teachers weren't ready at that time because we were still living in, in a place of two solitudes in this province. So there were classrooms of primarily uh, non-Indigenous kids who had no idea what the life of 
indigenous kids looked like, sound like. Some of them, I mean, thought that indigenous kids didn't exist anymore. Others were at a place in their journey where they saw them only as people of the past, not realizing that they had lives just as, you know, as daring and exciting and boring at times as they did. And so a lot of consideration was given to what would meet the needs. How do we address the beginnings? We started with um, our summer academy workshops. And those are three-day workshops for teachers where we were teaching uh, Aboriginal, uh, at that time using the word Aboriginal, um, perspectives, later Indigenous perspectives. And, and we looked at culture and art and history and um, um, sacred and non-sacred traditions. And um, how do you apply that in terms of linkages to, to the curriculum in terms of citizenship, you know, well beyond, uh, well beyond history and social sciences, because people who are real people exist in all areas of life. So we were excited, and those very first programs in, I'm, I'm going to say, man, I'm going to say probably 2009, 2000. Yeah, maybe around 2009, they started. The first ones were hugely undersubscribed by our teachers, which is so unusual because everything else is always full, full to the breaking point. So we have to talk, stop then and say, why? The government says you want this massive, overwhelming resource. You offer a three-day course, but nobody's taking it. If they're not taking it, would they open a book? Would they do further research? What do we need to bridge the gap, to bring the two solitudes together? Somewhere around that time, our, 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 the person who looks after a, a lot of our, our professional learning and our contacts with different organizations um, was, was in Israel at a, a very difficult time in Israel's history. And she came across a program where they brought together children in the classrooms, Israeli kids and Arab kids, and they had them bring their grandparents in. And the focus was food. And they said, share with us something that you love that is, some, that is a huge part of your family's tradition and cook it for us and tell the story. And through that food, and through the people, they began to create gaps so that, close gaps, because when, when the children and their grandparents came across people who said, you know, Arabs are nothing but scum and we need to eliminate them because they're just taking, or Israelis are nothing but scum and we need to eliminate them because they're only about taking. They would stop and they would remember their time cooking and sharing food and talking about each other's cultural traditions. And they were able to bridge through their sameness the differences. And that was an aha moment. And that teaching is often all about those aha moments. And that was the birth of something that we called the Books of Life. So this was a really interesting project. We went back to the government and we said, instead of creating this gigantic, this big resource that teachers may not be ready to use yet, let's start with breaking down the two solitudes. So let's find some classrooms where there are predominantly Indigenous kids, and let's find some classrooms where there are not Indigenous kids, and let's have them talk about their lives. And then let's create an exchange between the two communities and create a conversation, some at that time mostly through letters, that would allow them to understand each other on a more human level. 
And this took a lot of work um, for, the, for the teachers, but it also gave them, um, I think, a tremendous platform for building their own learning. So the government funded this. It was way less expensive than doing this big program that likely nobody would use. And so Books of Life uh, brought the teachers in who were chosen, and there were 90, 90 separate classrooms at the time that were chosen. Each teacher was given $1,000, which back then was a fair bit of money. They were given training in um, storytelling. They were given training in um, how to set up sharing circles. They were given training in bookbinding. They were given training in, in how to facilitate discussions that would bring out a deeper level of information from their students. And I will tell you, I mean, some of the stuff here is just crazy. So we have boxes and boxes of the books of life, and it took on a life of its own. So this one is from the Northern Lights Secondary School in Moosonee. And in 2011, 2012, these students got together and they, they talked about what their life looked like. This particular group was very big on, on, on collages. And yeah, like a lot of teenage kids, they're big on cars. They're big on Canada. They're big on, you know, believe. They're big on sports. It's a lot of text heavy stuff, but you know, pictures of their community, things that they felt were so important to them that maybe, maybe other people in other students across Ontario wouldn't know. So, you know, this was just one community that went through and talked about all of the things that were, that this particular group liked. Other books, so this is stories from the four directions. That's how they chose to link their stories. How do, how do we take our stories and link them to the four directions? How, what makes them important? So they talked about honesty. And they, they, they celebrated the craft work that they did as part of this. So this teacher brought in an elder to, to reinforce the teachings of, of older skills and then the people got the children in the classroom the youth in the classroom engaged in it you know and and i and poems here people will hate you rate you shake you and break you but how strong you stand is what makes you and suddenly my ancestors are behind me be still they say watch listen you are the result of the love of thousands. I mean, this is all kids' message, message. They had drum making and they recorded this journey. Each kid got a copy. It was wonderful. Wonderful. The stories were amazing. Some of the books are fantastically and professionally bound. Others come straight from the heart. But in this book, they use the pictographs of their people, and they tell the stories in English and in Anishinaabe, so that the two languages are together on a page because people without language are no longer people. And that was really an important lesson of discovering, discovering for not just this class, but when this book went to other classrooms, the same discussions happen. I, 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 this is really so much the genesis of, of where we went afterwards. This was kind of the mother of it all, I do believe. This one is expressions of residential school. I'll tell you, we weren't talking about residential schools um, when this project was started. This school did. This school did their research and they decided it would be important to learn about residential schools, create art, create poetry, put together photographs, uncover the pain, it is mine. 
It enters as love changing me, using me. I mean, this is wonderful, powerful stuff. And then as it goes on and we start thinking, you know, working through the book, imagine how much other children across this, this province learned from the wisdom of other classrooms. I mean, that's a deep, deep learning. Deep, deep learning. Wonderful stuff. And there are some that, that what's in a name? In, in this classroom, primarily non-Indigenous kids, they were, they were very much taken by the idea of spirit animals. And so each child had the opportunity to choose, if they could choose their spirit animal and not go through a journey where the spirit animal chose them, what would they choose and why? This one, my name is Caleb. It is a Hebrew name that means wholehearted. My mom and dad gave me this name. They named me Caleb because it's a name from the Bible, from nature, I think. I would be a fox because I can run fast and I'm strong. So this was another way of approaching it in a way that, that was respectful. Finding our place in Canada. These were, um, these were students in Ottawa from, from a, uh, an ELL class. And this was one of the unintended consequences. These are non-Indigenous kids. But most of the kids in this school are English as a second language students, and they are coming from refugee and, and new Canadian families who were just settling in Canada, and they were trying to figure out what is Canada and what is Ontario all about? What makes this culture real? And so the study of, of the, our Indigenous communities was important to them. But then they were able to link it to where they came from and how they felt being part of a society, but not really part of a society. So there was a lot of really deep learning going on. There's one here somewhere, I wish I could find it right this second, that simply talks about um, the women. And it talks about all the women in their lives who have been change makers, who have made them who and what they are. And then of course, there's the foods that we eat. So as I say, there were many books and they were exchanged among many, many classrooms um, throughout the province. And for the longest time, we got requests from libraries and community groups and schools to, to have the books of life uh, sent to them, and uh, we used that, at, they used that as launching off points for conversation to build that deeper connection as to who and what we are as Canadians and how do we bring together our very different histories to a place where we are all respectful of understanding and moving forward. So it was powerful. It was really powerful. So that's that's probably a longer piece than you would like, but that was kind of the beginning from from where we began to think, okay, where 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 do we go from that? Well, you know, at the same time, because things tend to emerge together, um, starting we were beginning at the very beginning of the Governor General's literacy camps. Um, in 2005, OTF was a partner uh, in the Governor General's literacy camps with Frontier College. And we made sure that, that um, the, camp, the literacy camps were well resourced and, and well looked after. And so it was mainly fly-in communities and fly-in schools where we would send a, a group of people to work with the children to build and enhance their literacy, but also to respect their own language and culture because uh, our people are guests in their community. And uh, the best learning 
goes two ways. The best learning is that connection where the teacher teaches, but the student also teaches. And that, that creates you know, this wonderful, wonderful ball of learning. Um, so we've been a part of that from the very, very beginning. And I was really fortunate this year to be able to travel to one of the communities, Iabama uh, Tungong, and spend the whole day at the school. And I was able to give out some, some prizes, some prizes, some gifts. Like I gave gifts to every student in the school. Um, that school goes from kinder, pre-kindergarten to grade nine. After grade nine, uh, children unfortunately have to fly out of their community and, and go to school in other places very, very difficult. And so um, a lot of the young people are still choosing not to leave the community and simply to marry young, have families young, and, and to live on the land as best they can. Choices are choices, but I always think you have more choices when you have literacy and numeracy behind you. And so if, if you don't mind, one of the things that we did was we challenged our the group in in Met one to to create pictures of what what is it that you love what gives meaning to your life when when you are are away from home or you're sad or you need a lift what is it that that makes you feel Wonderful. And so we picked uh, six of cards to create into note cards celebrating our 75th anniversary, and we've been giving them as gifts, celebrating the wonderful, wonderful children from that community. You know, this one says the most beautiful thing in nature is the moon. That's awesome. You know, something very simple, very simple. The most beautiful thing is nature. And remember, we're all kids, so flowers and sunset. And this one I loved because it just shows you mermaids are everywhere. And she says, mermaids make me smile. Because these are children, you know? We don't, get, we don't live with labels. We, we are just people. I loved this one because she says, this is the flag of my community. And it makes me smile. And the final one was, I smile when I'm with my cousins, because family is so important. But that was, that was important to us, our, our link with Frontier College and, and the Governor General's Literacy Camps. That was an, and has been and continues to be an amazing experience. So that's been since 2005. In 2016, we, we joined forces with Inspire, amazing, amazing group who, and, and we have been uh, supporters of their national gathering of uh, for Indigenous education, and it's held in different parts of the country every year. And so we, we give money to sponsor workshops, and it is, I went this year, and it is probably one of the best conferences I have ever attended in 37 years. The energy in that room was palpable. Not only did you learn so much in the individual workshops, but it was the participants themselves who were so enthusiastic about what they're doing, what they're learning, what they're thinking, all their connections, and the sharing is amazing. Now, they do set aside rooms for people who just want to gather together and, and share ideas. I found they were, most people didn't use them because we shared in coffee breaks. We shared in, in hallways. We shared in between on the way to sessions. That's, that, those were natural connections that people made. Uh, and it worked. It worked really, really well. On our website, OTF. Dot on dot ca. We've cached a lot of our, our learning materials, and our learning materials go from really kindergarten to grade to grade twelve. And each each of the learning materials are identified as to what grade they belong to, and uh, 
what subject areas they connect to within the Ontario curriculum. And it gives you um, uh, lesson plans, but also background notes and guidance. So we have, we have something called Survive and Thrive, which is for new teachers and occasional teachers. And uh, on that right now is a feature on, um, on Indigenous education to get people who are new to teaching more comfortable with with understanding that first off, this must be taught. You cannot wait till you're an expert. These are important conversations that cannot wait. So get on there and look, begin the conversation, begin the exploration. And if you need to learn along with your class, that's an okay journey. That can be a very rich journey too. And, and that's part of what we teach. We have our OTF Connects webinars, and we have put so many uh, different webinars on there specifically dealing with um, the teaching of FNMI issues. And um, if I can just remind myself. Okay. So in the FNMI issues that, that were there, I, I'm always amazed. So there's a two-part series on implementing Indigenous education in social studies and histories that's for um, that's divided between grades four and six, links into the curriculum pieces there, but it also links into grades seven, eight, and ten. And it's all um, inquiry-based learning and resources are provided. We can't, not only do we do these in live time, but then we cache them so that if you go on our website and you look for OTF Connects, anyone, any teacher or interested person can access these resources and, and take a good look at them. So in the first part, we're looking at understanding Indigenous worldviews and protocols. And we look at the importance of local relationships and developing um, an understanding of how this affects um, how we approach social studies and history. You know, so it's about respectful conversations and building those. In part two, we look at how do we embed FNMI histories and traditions in history and social studies classes because it's part of the specific curriculum of those grades. But there are also ideas of how to do it in, in other curriculums. Um, we have another one called Making Things Right. And the first part is the title in Anishinaabe, I believe. And it talks about um, how, did, how do we support teachers in terms of the implementation of the revised social studies curriculum? You know, how do we fulfill the calls to actions, particularly 62 and 63, that ask us to embed in our teaching history and culture from, from a respectful and truthful um, relationship? So, you know, we talk about how colonialism has and continues to impact Indigenous peoples today? What are some strategies and resources that will support your professional practice as you move on in your teaching? And how can you create a healthy and inclusive learning environment that supports equity and well-being during the course of your teaching? Those are all good things and, and we were really proud to host that webinar. Supporting Indigenous education leads was something we've also done. Um, a number of the school boards have Indigenous education leads, but they, they're few and far apart. They're all over the province, and they just didn't have a way to connect with each other. And so OTF offered to host on, on our platform, uh, we have called it the Blackboard Collaboration Platform, we offered to host them. And so through, through our platform now, 
all these indigenous educations are able to connect with each other, share ideas, share resources, share best practices, and talk about some of the wonderful experiences that they have had. It's rich. It's really rich. Um, even on, we have a section, it's probably the best in North America, in my opinion. We have a section called Inspire Financial Learning. We have one, uh, we have one section in there that's called um, Conceptualization, Creation, and Construction of the Mohawk Village Memorial Park. And this is actually a way, the vehicle by which to explore financial literacy with your class. It, um, two Indigenous educators from um, the Six Nations of the Grand River developed a two-part les lesson. It uses authentic Indigenous teachings and voice, and it couples it that, this with financial literacy concepts. It's worth an explore because it's not something that you might think of on your own. And yet what a launching spot for multitude of math lessons and environmental lessons and ways to look at your community and maybe ways you haven't thought of. So as you can tell, I'm really proud of what we do here. Um, so much of what we do is learning that is for teachers, by teachers. So we find teachers who are doing really exciting things in their classroom, and we bring them forward, and we, we give them the opportunity to teach other teachers, whether it's through a workshop, a summer institute, a webinar. Our TLC, our Teacher Learning Co-op Project, allows teams of teachers to get together to research and 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 then pursue a project that they they can follow up to other teachers and integration of indigenous content through experiential learning in our existing curriculum is one of the pieces here and i'll have the link for you because this is worth a read. This is pretty exciting stuff. And then another one that they did was infusing Indigenous perspectives and Indigenous ways of knowing into mathematics. Again, I think, I think a lot of uh, teachers, and I think our students too, are, are really desirous. They're hungry for this kind of embedded learning so that you're not learning Mathematic. You're learning a worldview. You're learning a respectful, cultural, kind of social justice lens in some ways, but but the learning is deep. It's not it's not the usual surface learning. You have to go down and dig and work, and and it's good. It builds creativity. Um, we have in the past we have brought together the Ontario. Um, uh, Association of Deans of Education and we have brought them in and worked with them as a conference on creating circles of hope in Indigenous education where we work together to talk to the deans of education who direct the learning of our future teachers. Says, How can you in your programs approach this and embed this as part of teacher education study in a way that's meaningful and respectful. We, we, we also worked really hard with um, something called the Curriculum Forum. So teachers, teachers love to get together to talk about their subject. <laughs> that's no surprise. So you know, it's no surprise that all the science teachers would naturally begin to form a science teacher association because they all get together and we can all kind of nerd out real happily on the thing that we're passionate about, whether it's art or geography or drama or, or math or, you know, literature, whatever it is, we're crazy about our subject. But we, we hold a subject association um, conference we bring people in, and one of one of the ones that was so successful uh, was based on um, 
the teaching and the embedding of indigenous ways of knowing within all our subject areas. And, and that was a rich, rich, rich conference, very expertly led by, by one of our, our people who works so hard. So you may recall that when I started, I said we started with a summer institute on Indigenous Aboriginal education at that time, and it wasn't full. The teachers didn't come. The last two years, it's full the first day it opens, and the waiting list is so long. Teachers are hungry for this. They are, they are understanding that we are indeed all of us treaty people and that we need to move forward um, towards reconciliation, but we can only do it through understanding the truth first. So that's our journey at OTF and probably didn't answer all the questions you wanted. But man, it, it, it has been so exciting and it has been so wonderful. Ontario Teachers Federation is the voice of all the teachers in Ontario. So French. whether you are a French teacher teaching in a French language school, or you're an elementary school teacher, or you're a high school teacher in the public system, or you're in the Catholic system, we represent all of those teachers, 180,000. But we also have as associate members all of the students of the faculties of education, and we we have um, we have uh, committees that work with um, all of the faculties of education to make sure that the learning that is that is. Um, proffered to our, our future teachers is meaningful and relevant and uh, exciting and challenging because that's what education is, it's exciting and challenging at the same time. Um, so we, we, that's why we bring in the deans of education because of our relationship with the student teachers. Um, we focus primarily on teacher-led learning as, as the vehicle because uh, that's that's just our role we don't we don't look after principals and vice principals however I have to say for years my director in, in Upper Canada used to say can you find a way for me to get some of my principals into that course and I think oh, I don't think there's a, you know, even a little bit of room. There's no way because there's too many teachers in this. So when I think about the different ways that we use to evaluate whether our program is working or not, whether it's touching all of the all of the places that we thought were important to touch, um, I, I guess I think of a couple of things. First off, we never would hold a conference a workshop, a summer institute, a conference, without providing people a feedback form. Um, in older days, we would do this as a paper form that people dropped off as kind of their ticket out the door, which, you know, people who work in classrooms are very familiar that that's what we do. It's a ticket out the door. You drop it and you are out the door and you're fine. Um, nowadays, we tend to do it as a uh, as part of a thank you email for attending, and it's a quick link, and people fill in their survey online. But one of the things about an engaging, a really engaging workshop, conference, or learning opportunity, is that it was not. It was okay. It was. It, it was fun. I learned a lot. You know, it, it's not, people are so into it that they write all, they, they write a great deal. They put their heart and their passion because what the conference or the seminar or, or, the, or the, the summer institute did was it allowed them to make connections between the classrooms that they teach in and the work. And, and they're making these connections all the time and they're telling us about it. So that's, that's an important feedback form and that helps us to, to, to continually make our work better 
or based on the suggestions of participants, um, to plan the next series so that it touches on something that's important and, and needful within, within our, our teachers' classrooms. I think the best way, though, to decide whether or not you're hitting the right marks is whether or not you have good use of your program. So when I see that the webinars are being passed, often by word of mouth, teacher to teacher, you need to sit down with a cup of tea in your jammies and watch this. It will change everything about how you deliver mathematics in your classroom. You need to sit down and watch this because I saw a demonstration of how to get reluctant kids to engage in drama that I would never have thought of in my own. So it's that word of mouth and there's nothing, part of the teacher community is, is teachers talking to teachers and you hear that buzz all the time. Everywhere I go, people talk about OTF Connects and webinars. Um, I recently had somebody who was a principal say, oh my gosh, I lost the link for, and I'm not sure how to get back on because I really need to review that webinar. It was so good. And so I walked her through. How do you, how do you find the cached webinar so that you, you can find it easily? And, and that tells me that we're on the right path and we're doing the right things. It also tells me that, that, that we're listening. So when we did those first summer institutes and nobody, well, I, I won't say nobody came, but it was really undersubscribed. That makes you sit down and say, what is the barrier? It's a really good program. It is exactly what is needed in the classrooms of today. Where is the missing link? Why is the learning not taking place? Now that's kind of teacher thinking that, that, that maybe people on the outside don't realize goes on, but teachers reflect pretty much every day, at the end of every day, over what worked and what didn't. And, and you try to analyze, all right, what was the component or the two components that made this lesson stellar and really click with this set of kids? Or why did this lesson not work for this set of kids? And you learn as much from, from your failures as you do your successes because it, 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 it forces you to, to go back and either reteach or approach the subject from a very different angle. And we did the same thing with, with, um, with the, uh, the summer institutes. When we realized that the teachers weren't connecting to the subject area because they didn't see how it related to them and their classrooms. We thought, that's what we need. That's the aha, and that's when we moved to Books of Life. And Books of Life became the launching point so that now all of our, whether it's webinars or, or um, uh, Survive and Thrive or workshops or, or institutes, oh my gosh, the teachers can't get enough. So, that tells me if our teachers are talking about it and our teachers are on waiting lists hoping to get in there, you know, the first thing I do in a faculty of education presentation is, you know, when I go through, I, I, I actually have them take out their smartphones and and register for the for our Twitter feed for for um, for the OTFPD because I say when these things open, you have to strike like a ninja. So if you have the Twitter feed or you have the email that's coming to your phone, you're just going to hit the hot link and you're in. And, you know, sadly, I wish there was enough money that we didn't have to do a first come. But that's the world we live in right now. So I would say our most tech savvy people are probably taking a lot of advantage. We try to spread it around, but, but <sighs> We do measurement, we do a lot of conversation, we do a lot of deconstruction with our teachers. Um, so less on the formal evaluation. Um, some of the surveys that we will do with teachers, we will talk directly about our programs and we will have them, um, we will have them 
tell us whether they know of it or have used it or have connected with it. They'll tell us, you know, maybe a, a broader use space. So we, we do measure these things, but the biggest measurement is the fact that, that really we, we've got lines headed out the door and we'll never be able to accommodate them all. <laughs> So when I think about Indigenous education, a quote springs to mind um, from, from Justice Sinclair. Um, I admire Ron Sinclair very much, and I've listened to him a lot over the years. He has some wisdom. And he does say that reconciliation is, is like climbing a mountain. And there are going to be times when you get bogged down and it's hard, and it's not fun, and you'll want to give up. But the view from the top is so spectacular. It is worth every step of that journey. And I think that's an image that teachers connect to. I think the other thing that they connect to is, is the fact that, that Within the calls for action, within truth and reconciliation, it is absolutely true that you must, you must explore and, and understand, deeply understand the truth before you can move towards reconciliation, before you can move together as, as one group um, united in, in understanding and caring and moving forward as a society that that um, much of our past has kept us in two solitudes but we will never we will never grow as a nation and become all that we need to be um, unless we come together and forge a way forward that is uniquely Canada and respectful of of all our cultures, our traditions, and I must say languages, because language is important. It's, uh, the fundamental beliefs of all people are, are invested in their language. And, and so you, you, to translate that just doesn't convey the same things. Uh, respectful conversations mean that people learn other people's languages because they're important cultural pieces. And, and teachers are, are primarily good to this for, for all of this because we are by nature, I think, very optimistic people, people who believe in a better world, people who are very fond of, of social justice issues where we, we tr do not single people out but try to figure out how can you be part of the wonderful quilt that is my classroom? You know, that, that, and, and, and so um, the one big fear that I hear from teachers over and over again is that what if I get it wrong? What if I'm inappropriate? What if I don't teach it the right way? And I think that's an important conversation too. But the real piece, I think, is that it is better to start than not start. That if you need to walk the journey of truth with your students and you learn it at the same time, then you need to do that. There are lots of people within Canada and our First Nations certainly are chief among them, where we know very little about their history. Sometimes I think we know more about their far history than we know about their near history. And, and, and so part of truth is making sure that all those voices are heard and all those places in history are taken and all the cultural icons that mean something to many people are, are explored and understood and, and, and known how to treat with respect. These are all things that resonate. So 
Um, I, I think most of our teachers are willing to climb the mountain and uh, they are looking for resources and so that's why I'm very thankful for, for this particular uh, video series and cache of, of resources. So this will be another place where our teachers can go when they're wondering what, can, what do I need to know about this before I teach it. So when I, when I think about, about where we are in education now and what I dream for in the future, Indigenous education is so much a part of it because our First Nations, Inuit and Métis people have had, they have been the backbone of this country, but, but while they provided so much that allowed this country to be built, there was also so much taken. And it has not been a fair exchange. I would love to see um, a classroom where there are open conversations in, in every literature class that discusses, well, from an Aboriginal perspective, this is considered really okay. Or from an Aboriginal or Indigenous perspective, uh, this is problematic. So you do that in the literature classroom. It's not just history and social studies. People, people are in all walks of life. So, you know, uh, being informed in your, in your technical drawing class of the types of structures that are part of our traditional uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis buildings and, and, and ways of moving around through space, I think can inform uh, folks. Um, I am I'm so glad that we are moving beyond a time. I, I have to tell you, back in, back in, I know it seems a long, long time ago, but back in 1983, I was teaching history uh, to a, a class of Indigenous students. And um, we wound up basically turning the textbook in, and uh, I sent it to the storage room. We never used it again. Because the very first page talked about civilization. And uh, their definition was of a civilization would be was when people gathered together in towns and cities and created um, uh, a non-nomadic life. Well, the students I was teaching, some of the smartest people I'll ever teach, and I'm still in contact with many of them today, they lived a nomadic lifestyle. They, they had their winter camp, they had their spring camp, they had their summer camp, and families moved. Sometimes different sections of the families moved together, but they didn't settle in towns. They went to town to shop, they chose not to live in town. Does that mean they're not civilized? The word has had a connotation that, that's moved far beyond its Latin roots, which mean a town, to something quite different. And, and the, the students in my class were found it very offensive. So we shut the history book and we had some real learning go on. And, and from, from those conversations, we made a determination that um, we would keep a couple of books in there, along with other books, pre-internet folks, and we would use them as resource materials, but that we would remember that resources are stuck in the time in which they're written. And that became a learning experience for my students too, because that was the beginning of their understanding that there's an old quote that says, truth belongs to the conqueror. Well, I would really like to see truth belong to everyone. And, and I hope that our education future allows that truth to be released and free, and that those full conversations can occur and uh, citizens can grow and develop.